Yeah, thanks for the kind invitation to speak here. So this talk is going to be quite different from Greg's in that I will be trying to present a different perspective on the quantum zipper instead of like giving a different proof of it. Okay, so I'll take it as an input and I'll and we'll go from there. So today's talk is about uh, liberal conformal field theory and its dynamics when you evolve it using the quantum zipper. Okay, so uh, uh, we are going to discuss these random surfaces uh, with conformal symmetries called liberal quantum gravity. And uh, these random curves with conformal symmetries called schoen Loven evolution. And these are two simulations of the things. So in this, uh, this cartoon over here, and that represents the quantum zipper that Sheffield introduced. So you start with an LQG surface, and then you want to glue its left and right boundaries together. And surprisingly, what you get is an LQG surface that created by an independent uh, SLE curve. So a follow-up work of uh, Duplante, Miller, and Sheffield proves variants of this, where you attach various things to the boundary of your LQG surface. So in this case, you attach a collection of loop trees of LQG disks. And in, the, in this case over here, you attach these uh, continuum random trees to the boundary. And in both of these cases, there is a way to glue together the trees. And what you get is LQG that created by an independent SLE curve. And this SLE curve is not going to be simple. It's going to be self-fitting in this middle case. And there's going to be a space-filling curve uh, in this case on the right. And so I'm going to explain how these dynamics um, are applicable to random surfaces that come from the uh, real conformal field theory. And then I'll give a couple applications of this. Okay, so to define LQG, uh, we need to first understand the Gaussian free field. Um, I'll just show a few pictures. So this is a random generalized function on the plane. So more precisely, it's, a, it's an element of, the of a negative overlap space. So, okay, on the left, uh, you have this heat chart. So at places where the field is very red, it's taking very large positive values. And here where it is green, it is taking very large negative values. On the right-hand side, we plot this uh, graph of the GFF. Uh, it does not admit pointwise values. So to make sense of this graph, you have to um, modify, you have to integrate against some kind of smooth bump function. And, uh, and from both figures, you can see that it's a very fractal kind of geometry that arises. So, okay, now I want to understand the LQG geometry associated to the Gaussian free field. So you have this uh, LQG parameter gamma, which will be between zero and two, and let H be a Gaussian free field on the unit disk. So we want to make sense of this geometry that arises from the Riemannian metric tensor, E to the gamma H times the Euclidean metric tensor. And this doesn't make rigorous sense because H does not admit pointwise values. But regardless, we can still define um, an area measure, AH, and a boundary length measure, LH. And uh, the way to do this is to replace H with a smooth version of H, and then renormalize and take a limit. And that gives you these measures on the unit disk and the unit circle. And this procedure is called Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Uh, more recently, the LKG metric DH was also constructed, and this is a much more uh, uh, challenging undertaking because it's a very non-local function of the Gaussian free field. And so given a Gaussian free field H, you can understand this LKG geometry as being this metric measure space, AH, LH, DH, equipped with a conformal structure as well. Okay, so uh, the last thing I want to mention here is this coordinate change. So if you have um, a domain D and a field H on D, and you have a different domain field pair, D tilde, H tilde, suppose that F is a conformal map between the two domains such that you have this uh, coordinate change formula over here. Then it turns out that the uh, geometry associated to H and H tilde is the same. So more precisely, AH, LH, and DH gives the same metric measure space as AH tilde, LH tilde, and DH tilde. And so we want to interpret this as being one LQG service, uh, which is embedded in two different ways. Okay, so that's uh, LQG. <coughs> and here's a simulation. So this, in this figure on the right, each of these squares has roughly the same LQG area. So here, where the, your um, GFF is very large, 
you get a very dense geometry here corresponding to a large LTG area. Here, GF is very negative and you have a very small LTG area. Okay, so I'm gonna mention two reasons why I think LQG is interesting. And the first of these is because uh, random planar maps are expected to converge in the scaling limit to liberal quantum gravity. So on the left, we have a simulation of a random planar map and we'll assume it falls into the gamma LQG uh, universality class. And maybe it has N faces. We have to embed it in the unit disk in a quote unquote conformal way. So how we might do this is we might put the boundary vertices of the random planar map on the unit circle, attach a spring to every edge of the random planar map, and then <clears throat> kind of let it go and bounce into a stable configuration. This gives you what is called the harmonic embedding. And so you start with the random planar map, you can find an embedding of it into the unit disk, and it gives you this a geometry where you have an area measure AN, which comes from, um, taking the counting measure on the vertices and rescaling it. You likewise have this boundary measure LN and you have a distance function DN, which is the graph distance uh, rescaled by some power of N. You can also create a random geometry starting with a Gaussian free field or a variant of a Gaussian free field and taking this liberal quantum gravity geometry associated to it. Now the widely held belief is that these uh, the discrete measures A, H, H, N, A, N, L, N, and D, N converge in the limit to A, H, L, H, and D, H. And this was proved uh, for, the for some very special cases. Uh, Green, Miller, and Sheffield proved that this is true for the um, method CRT random planar maps uh, um, under the harmonic embedding. And Holden and Sun proved that uniform random planar maps under the so called Cardi embedding uh, converge to LQG in the scaling limit. It's an important open question to, to prove more of these convergence results for different kinds of random planar maps with uh, different statistical physics models attached to them. So that's LQG. <laughs> and now I want to talk about Schramm-Dothan evolution, these random curves. Um, they arise as a scaling limit of uh, statistical physics models. So on the left here, we have the easing model and it has plus boundary conditions on the left and minus boundary conditions on the right. And the interface between them uh, is supposed to converge, is shown to converge in the scaling limit to SLE3. In the middle, we have critical percolation. So for each hexagon, you flip a coin, you color the hexagon yellow or blue. And again, you look at the interface between the two colors, and this is going to give you a curve, which in the scaling limit is SLE6. And the last case is uh, the uniform spanning tree where the, the curve that traces the boundary of the tree is going to converge to SLE8. So SLE has three different phases. When kappa is less than or equal to four, you get a simple curve. When kappa is between four and eight, strictly, uh, you get a, a curve which is intersecting itself but not crossing itself. And when kappa is at least eight, you get a space filling curve. Okay, so here are some simulations of SLE. SLE3, which is simple, SLE6 is self-hitting, SLE32 is space filling. And SLE comes in two variants. You have the forward and SLE variants. And today I'm mostly going to talk about reverse SLE. And so this is a random growth process where you start uh, on the left here with um, the plane and a marked point. And at, this is the time zero configuration. And at time t, um, you have a random curve, which is kind of obtained by pushing the plane towards this red point and upwards. And so this red point here corresponds to this red point here. So this uh, blue conform uh, this blue region here can be conformally mapped to this blue region here by this map GT. And GT is basically doing what these arrows are showing you. So the definition of uh, SLE is in terms of this stochastic differential equation, which we won't need for now. Okay, so now that I've mentioned what LQG and SLE are, I want to give a statement for uh, Sheffield's quantum zipper in the case when kappa is at most, kappa is less than four, and gamma is uh, cap, square root of kappa. So uh, 
for me, the cleanest version of the statement involves distributions modulo additive constant. So this is an equivalence class of distri distributions where two distributions F1 and F2 um, are in the same equivalence class if they differ by a constant. And now um, I want to look at this uh, distribution modulo additive constant H0 obtained by starting with the GFF and adding this log singularity of size two over square root kappa at the origin. Now I want to glue the left and right boundaries together according to the LKG length measure associated H0. And this doesn't make, uh, this does not make sense vigorously because H0 is only defined modulo additive constant. So the uh, length measure is only defined <laughs> modulo multiplicative constant. But this doesn't matter because the ratio of LKG lengths does not depend on this constant. So we can still tell which point here is supposed to be zipped to which point here. And so you can carry out this uh, zipping procedure. And this gives you a random geometry, which is a random surface decorated by a random curve. We will embed this random geometry in the upper half plane. Uh, we run a parameterized time based on the size of this curve. So uh, we are going to use a half plane capacity to measure size. So this notion of size does not depend on the, the field. It only depends on the curve. So for the random surface that you get, we can describe it using this field HT and the random curve is going to be A dot T. So the statement of uh, Scott's quantum zipper can be given as follows. So suppose that tau is a stopping time that only depends on the curve then uh, surprisingly, the field and the curve that you get are independent of each other. Uh, the law of the curve is going to be reverse SLE run until the stopping time. And the law of the field is the same as the original uh, law of the, the law of the original field H0. It's just this GFF plus this log singularity. So this gives us uh, a stationary picture where as we zip the field to itself, the law the marginal law of the field is not changing and is also independent of the curve that you get. Okay, so here I emphasize that H, uh, H T is a distribution modulo additive constant. So we haven't yet chosen a way to tie down this additive constant. Okay, uh, I just wanna quickly mention uh, the, that there is a critical version of this. The previous slide talked about kappa less than four and gamma less than two. For critical LQG, uh, you get kappa is equal to four and gamma is equal to two. And uh, this, the same result is true in the setting. And this is due to uh, <coughs> works of Holden and Powell who show that um, you can do some kind of uh, uh, procedure that glues LQG to itself. And, and then cover their Miller and Schultz show that this gluing procedure is unique. So uh, it's conformal welding. Okay, so we have the simple case regime here, kappa less than four and kappa is equal to four. And so I wanna discuss the kappa between four and eight case now. So this is kind of a lot more complicated, but it's not, but at least at the high level, it's not too hard to explain. So we have uh, the same uh, random distribution modulo additive constant H naught. And then what we're going to do is we're going to attach a Poissonian collection of, of trees of LKG disks to the boundary. So I have the pink trees on the left and the blue trees on the right. And it turns out that there's a natural notion of boundary length on the boundaries of these uh, forests. And you can make left and right boundaries together according to this natural length notion of length. And this gives us a new, um, random geometry decorated by a self-intersecting curve. And again, we're gonna parameterize time by this Euclidean size of the curve and H T is a field and A to T is a curve. Then uh, what the Plante and Miller and Sheffield proved is that um, if you run this process until a stopping time that only depends on the curve, then the field and curve are independent. The law of the curve is just reverse SLE run until the stopping time and the field is uh, the same as the original field in law. Okay, so this gives us two different uh, quantum zipper stories, one for the simple curve, kappa less than or equal to four, and one for the self-intersecting SLE, kappa between four and eight. So for this talk, I want to explain some extensions of these quantum zippers. 
the first extension is to the setting where kappa is at least eight. So you get the space fitting curve as an interface. And the second extension, instead of looking at the Gaussian free field modulo additive constant, I want to just instead look at these random surfaces that arise from liberal conformal field theory. So uh, this perspective has multiple applications. Firstly, we're going to prove a VPC differential equations for LCFT on surface on, on the unit disk. And we'll also prove that whole plane SLD is reversible for kappa is at least eight. Okay, so to explain the kappa at least eight quantum zipper, I need to first discuss uh, the mating of trees uh, of the Plantain, Meda, and Sheffield. So we're going to start with a pair of correlated Brownian motions, xt and yt. And how I want to construct a continuum random tree from each of these uh, processes. So how do we do that? On the left, we have this curve xt. And I plot this graph. I draw these horizontal line segments that stay underneath the graph. And I identify points that lie on the same horizontal line segment. So you can imagine taking a uh, um, some glue and just painting it on the underside of this curve then kind of horizontally flattening everything. And that will give you a random tree shown here. So for YT, you can also construct a random tree in the same way. And uh, the result of the plantain Miller sheffield shows that there is a way to mate these two trees together to get a random surface. And this random surface will be the real quantum gravity. And the interface between the curves will be shammed of an evolution. And the coupling of the parameters is given by kappa is 16 over gamma squared. So, okay, here's a different description of the same thing. You start with a certain uh, canonical LQG surface. And on top of it, you draw a space filling SLE independently. And suppose you run this process until the time that um, the A where you've covered is equal to T. Then we define these four lengths, xt minus, xt plus, yt minus, and yt plus. And then you can define the processes xt and yt by xt is xt plus minus xt minus, and yt is yt plus minus yt minus. And that gives you um, a process xt, yt. So starting with this LQG decorated by curve, you can get a process xt, yt, which corresponds to this pair of trees. So uh, this is really important. And one reason why is because this is the only known way to relate random planar maps to liberal quantum gravity. So in the discrete uh, for random planar maps decorated by, say, a, a spanning tree, you can find a bijection for, for such a planar map between a pair of trees and uh, the planar map. And you can take a scaling limit to get those trees to become these uh, continuum random trees here. <laughs> okay. Good. So given uh, the making of trees, I can state the, um, the quantum zipper result for kappa at least eight. So here we're gonna take kappa at least eight and gamma is four over square root of kappa. We use the same GFF again, modulo additive constant. And we're going to glue a pair of correlated random trees to the correlated continuum random trees to the boundary shown here and here. And as before, we're going to uh, zip these two trees together and they'll give us a random surface decorated by a random space filling curve. And we'll let HT be the field and A to T the curve. And you get precisely the same um, statement as before, the, up to a stopping time depending only on the curve, the field and curve are independent. The, the curve is SLE and the field is the same GFF as before. So this is the first result I wanted to mention. Okay, so for the second result, um, to motivate it, I want to explain uh, liberal conformal field theory. So the second reason why I think LQG is interesting is because it is used in the construction of liberal conformal field theory. So LCFT is a fund fundamental example of continuous con conformal field theory. It has a continuous spectrum and it's not as amenable to uh, other methods as like other CFTs are. Um, LQG can be used to give a probabilistic construction of LCFT. So how does that work? We want to define this uh, field. So we have this parameter gamma between zero and two, and we have this uh, Q, which is gamma over two plus two over gamma. 
and we're going to write P sub D for the law of the Gaussian free field on the unit disk, uh, normalized to have average equal to zero on the unit circle. So we're fixing its additive constant by assuming its average on the circle is zero. So now we can define the Liouville field on the unit disk. Uh, if you, you sample a pair H comma C, where H is going to be this GFS, and C is going to be sampled from this infinite measure on the real line. And then we let phi be H plus C, and the liberal field is going to be phi. And we write LF uh, sub D for the law of the liberal field. So this is an abuse of uh, probabilistic language. To be precise, um, we can define a, the measure LF sub D as a push forward of this uh, product measure under the the function that sends h comma c to h plus c. So this is the Liouville field. And we also want to add insertions to the Liouville field. So how does that work? If you want to add an insertion at the point C of size alpha, we're going to start with the original field, and we're going to wait for e to the alpha phi of z. And again, this doesn't make rigorous sense because uh, you cannot define phi of z pointwise, but you can still make sense of this measure using a regularization and renormalization procedure. And uh, what you get is this random field, which looks like the GFF with an alpha log singularity at the point z. So, now we can define the correlation functions of liver conformal field theory in terms of these uh, liver fields with insertions. So for example, here, if I want to define the correlation function corresponding to one bulk insertion at the origin, I will sample a liver field with an alpha insertion at the origin, and I'll take this Laplace transform of the LKG area and the LKG boundary length of the, of the disk. And so this gives us a, uh, a definition for the one point correlation function. This uh, quantity encodes the law of the area and the boundary length of the uh, liberal field. You can similarly define all sorts of correlation functions on all sorts of surfaces. So, for example, for the Riemann sphere here, you can define the three point correlation function in much the same way. And uh, to physicists, the primary interest is to solve for all the correlation functions of a conformal field theory. And this would be called solving LCFT. And there's been tremendous work in this direction. So uh, there's a breakthrough by Kupian and Rosen Vargas where they computed the three point correlation function for LCFT and they showed that it equals the BOZZ formula put forth by Don Otto and Zemologikov Zemologikov. Their argument depends on the BPZ equation for um, correlation functions of uh, conformal field theories. And so they subsequently, together with Guillermo, they computed all the correlation functions for surfaces without boundary. And this is via a procedure called the conformal bootstrap. So you start with the most fundamental uh, conformal uh, correlation functions and then uh, combine them to iteratively uh, uh, solve for higher order correlation functions. And so uh, these two works together uh, completely solve LCFT for the case of surfaces without boundary. Okay, um, so, so earlier I mentioned that one reason to care about LTG is because it comes as the scaling limit of random planar maps. And then from that perspective, uh, the making of trees uh, and quantum zipper type statements were uh, uh, proved. And now I want to show that from this other side of the world about the conformal field theory, uh, these quantum zipper type results are also applicable. So the key insight here uh, is just the following. If you have um, a, um, a distribution modular additive constant, And you can fix the additive constant in some non-canonical way. Maybe H <coughs> tilde is a representative. Mm -hmm. 
then um, if you sample a Lebesgue, um, a real number from the big measure on the real line, then um, this random distribution you get given by h hat plus c, this does not depend on the choice of h hat. So this is a crucial insight here. So the reason why this is true is simply because the big measure on the real line is translation invalid. So if you if you choose a different representative here, maybe you have h double hat instead, then h double hat plus c um, is going to um, equal h hat plus c time, where c time is uh, is good, just going to be c plus this difference in the in the um, in h double hat and h hat, and this is going also going to have the law of the big measure on the real line. So okay, so that's a lot of words, but the point is just that if you have a distribution modulo additive constant, uh, you can you can just not choose this additive constant uh, by fixing it, but just let it be any real number, kind of uniformly from the big measure. So starting with this um, quantum zipper statement <coughs> used by uh, Scott and uh, these various authors. If you just add a little bit typical real number to it, you immediately get the following statement. So um, you sample your field from your uh, uh, your field with an insertion at zero and an insertion at infinity. And then what you're going to do is you're going to zip this field to itself uh, according to the um, quantum zipper. So if kappa is bigger than four, you add the trees to the boundary and then you zip it up. Now, um, if tau is a stopping time that depends only on the curve, then the law of the field and curve is given by this explicit product measure here, where your curve is going to be this um, reverse SLE run until the stopping time tau, and your field is going to be this uh, liberal field. I would I want to say that this means that the field and curve are independent, but there would also be an abuse of probabilistic language because this is not a, a, a probability measure. But you, it is a product measure. So in that sense, they are independent. OK, so the quantum zipper is applicable to the liberal field with two insertions, one at zero and one at infinity. But you can just directly generalize this to all cases. So you can add arbitrary bulk insertions, and you can add arbitrary boundary insertions, and you can add a different insertion at infinity. You get the same result, except that now the curve and the field are not going to be independent. What is instead going to happen is the following. You have a curve, which is reverse SLE, uh, run until the stopping time. And then when you've done this uh, reverse SLE, it's going to send these points ZJ to these points G tau ZJ. So this is just when you do this uh, evolution, these points are moving around and ZJ moves here, XK moves here. You're just going to put the insertions at these new locations. And you're also going to have this um, term, which is coming from the, the product of derivatives of your uh, conformal map. So the proof of this is not very difficult given the previous slide. You're essentially going to just obtain this more complicated statement from the simple statement by some kind of reweighting of the field. This reweighting will add insertions to the field, and it also gives you this weighting by the derivative of the conformal map. Okay. So, the conformal field theory uh, gives you these uh, surfaces, which behave nicely under the quantum zipper in the sense that the law of the curve and the law of the field after zipping are tractable. And so, I want to use this uh, quantum zipper now to give an a result in LCFT. So we're going to fix a special choice of beta star, which is either minus gamma over two or minus two over gamma. Either choice is fine. And I want to define this correlation function here, where you have a bunch of insertions at the boundary points x1 to xn of sizes uh, beta 1 to beta n. They're going to have an insertion at the point w of size beta star. 
and you can also have an insertion at infinity. <laughs> so the correlation function uh, is going to encode the law of the area and boundary lengths of uh, the level field. So on the right-hand side here, we have this exponential of minus area and minus boundary lengths. And here, crucially, I want to emphasize that these two uh, coefficients for the boundary lengths, mu l and mu r, are related in this uh, kind of uh, difficult way, which will become clearer later on. So when you've set up um, the correlation function in this way with a special coupling of your cosmological constants, then you can obtain the boundary BPZ equation, which is shown here, is an order two differential equation with two derivatives in W. And this uh, equation was conjectured by Fatiev, Zamolodzikov, and Zamolodzikov. And they conjecture that you need to have this weird relationship between mu L and mu R uh, for this to hold. And they get this relationship by looking at special cases. So special uh, cases of the correlation function when they can they really check when this is true. So um, I'm going to give a proof of uh, this BPZ equation using the quantum zipper. And from this uh, proof, it will become clear why we have this coupling of sigma L and sigma R here. So we have two BPZ equations, one for gamma over two and one for two over gamma. And uh, each your, of proof, your proof will hold for all capital then? Yes, that's right, for all, for all choices of gamma, uh, you can get these two choices of B, and yeah. Okay, so the first case is your know, beta star is two over gamma, and then we're going to use the quantum zipper where kappa is less than or equal to four. So how do we do this? Um, so in this special case, this relationship sigma L and sigma R differ by beta star over two, it becomes very simple. It just becomes mu L plus mu R is equal to zero. So to set things up, we, start, we have this reverse SLE where you start your point at W naught is W, and then it's going to evolve over time and this uh, point is going to move around. So the claim is that if you define this MT here, which is just a correlation function together with uh, this conformal derivative terms, then MT is a martingale for this SLE process. And so how do we see this? Um, so let F phi be the function of the field obtained by just e to the minus A phi minus mu L phi, uh, minus mu L L minus mu R R. And because mu L plus mu R is equal to zero, you get this, uh, you can, write it in this way instead. So here you have the difference of the boundary lengths instead of um, this. So because of how we define this zipping up procedure, after I've zipped up for some amount of time, the left boundary length is shrinking by the same amount that the right boundary length is shrinking by. Uh, so f, at f of phi naught is the same as f of phi t for any choice of t. And this observation together with the quantum zipper kind of immediately tells you that MT is going to be a martingale because F of phi naught and F of phi T are the same quantity. So with this martingale in hand, is then pretty straightforward to obtain the BPZ equation. Uh, because uh, MT is a martingale, you just do your Edo calculus uh, computation. You write this down, you look for its DT term and DBT term. Because it's a martingale, the DT term vanishes, and that's equivalent to this statement over here, which is precisely the BPZ equation. So, um, so the beta is minus two over gamma BPZ equation is coming directly from this SLE martingale, which uh, is proved using the quantum zipper. Okay, so that's for the case when beta star is minus two over gamma. And I want to look at the other one, which is more complicated. Beta star is minus gamma over two. And so that corresponds to kappa bigger than four. So there's actually two cases here. You might have kappa between four and eight or just kappa bigger than eight. Uh, for the, this talk, I'm just gonna focus on this case where kappa is bigger than eight. The other case is similar. 
So as before, we want to define this process MT, which is a correlation function uh, times this uh, conformal derivative uh, product. And we are going to show that MT is a martingale. So this is more complicated than the previous case, but uh, it's not difficult to prove using the making of trees that uh, Scott and Koth has proved. So you again define f of phi to be e to the minus a minus uh, mu l l minus mu r r, and then you have um, x t and y t this correlated round in motion that arises in your making of trees description. Now what what happens is that this condition that mu l and mu uh, are, are, the, are related in this way, this is precisely the condition needed to make this quantity here a martingale. So this is not obvious at all from like what I've said so far, but it's really easy to compute these uh, down in motion uh, exponentials, you know, calculus stuff is, is very straightforward to check that this is a martingale assuming this. And now, phi naught and phi t are not the same quantity in general, but the expected value of phi t given phi naught is just phi naught because this is a martingale. So your changes in your boundary lengths and your changes in your area are kind of, uh, on average, they're canceling out. And as an immediate consequence of this, you, you obtain that mt is a martingale. So here, instead of f of phi naught being the same as f of phi t, you have this conditional expectation where f of phi t conditioned on phi naught is just f of phi naught. And so you can still write down the same equation and conclude that mt is a martingale. And as a, as a result, um, the same computation from the previous slide applies. And you immediately get the beta star is minus gamma over two um, BPC equation. OK. So for the LCFT quantum zipper, we have an application where we prove the boundary BPC equation for LCFT. So uh, let's put this in, in some, let, let me give some context for why this is interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, LCFT on closed surfaces is completely solved. And the way that the authors did that was they obtained the most basic correlation function, which is a three point correlation function on the sphere. And they proved that the conformal bootstrap is applicable. And so they can inductively obtain all correlation functions. So we want to carry out a similar program in the setting of uh, LCFT on surfaces with boundary. And so here, the most simple correlation functions are not, you have more than one, not just a three point uh, bulk sphere correlation function, you have a few different ones. And uh, in joint work with Guillaume Vemi, Sun Sun, and Tunan Zhu, we proved, uh, uh, sorry, I, I missed something on this slide. Before that, uh, in joint work with Guillaume Vemi and Sun we obtained one of the structure constants, which is a one bulk point structure constant for the disk. And in a future work, uh, together with Tunan Zhu, we're going to obtain the some of the other structure constants, like the three point boundary, uh, three boundary points for the disk uh, structure constant. And there, the boundary BPZ equation is a key input in obtaining these uh, structure constants. So that's uh, this co component of the, the program. This other part, which is a boundary conformal bootstrap, um, this has been initiated by Wu and co-authors uh, using similar methods as was done here. And hopefully uh, all of these things together will allow us to solve LCFT on surfaces with boundary. Okay. So there's a second application I want to mention, which is for SLE. So the quantum zipper um, result does not only give uh, applications for LCFT, but also for SLE. So um, given a curve eta in the upper half plane, you can define a curve eta r obtained by reversing time and inverting. So here you have a curve eta and under the conformal anti-conformal map z maps to one over bar is d, you get a different curve here, which is eta r. And a curve, a random curve is reversible if these two curves agree in law. If eta agrees in law with eta r, then eta is reversible. 
So for the case of caudal SLE, um, caudal SLE is reversible when kappa is less than or equal to eight. But however, when kappa is bigger than eight, uh, this is not reversible. So here is a figure of um, SLE with kappa is equal to 128. So the SLE curve is starting here and is ending up here. And uh, it fills out these red parts before it fills out the blue parts. It's a space filling curve. So this, this is maybe the only way of uh, visualizing it with a picture. And you can see that it's very much not uh, reversible. Near this end point, you get these uh, uh, circle looking things, but not here. So caudal SLE is not always reversible. Now, whole plane SLE is a variant of SLE uh, in the complex plane where your curve starts at infinity and ends at zero. So um, it's going to look like this. For kappa less than or equal to four, it's just going to be a random curve that comes in from infinity and goes to the origin. For kappa between four and eight, you get the same thing, but with a topology where it's allowed to hit itself. And when kappa is at least eight, you're simply going to get a space filling curve that just fills the whole plane. So it's going to look like something like this in, a, in a, an awful attempt at illustrating that. <coughs> so a whole plane SLE, um, by reversibility, we mean the, the curve has the same law when you invert the planes, sending zero to infinity and infinity to zero. And it's, it's already known in the literature that when kappa is less than or equal to four, a uh, whole plane SLE is reversible. And this is uh, due to Barbara and John. And when kappa is between four and eight, including eight, um, whole plane SLE is reversible. And this is uh, due to Miller and Sheffield. And together with Puy, uh, we will prove that whole plane SLE is reversible when kappa is at least eight. So in this space filling regime, uh, this random curve is still uh, reversible. So maybe I can just quickly say a couple of truth ideas. Uh, the main tool is to use the LCFT zipper to obtain a mating of trees type theorem for um, <coughs> So we start with a unit disk, and on the unit disk we have um, a liberal field um, with alpha insertion at the origin and beta insertion at one. And this is going to be um, alpha is Q minus gamma over four. Beta is three gamma over two. And let's say we condition on the field having boundary length equal to um, one. So condition on L zero is equal to one. So this whole boundary length is L zero. Now we start um, here and we're going to run space filling radial SLE. So that's a random curve in the disk from one to zero, which fills up the whole disk. So let's say I've run it for some amount of time. Uh, then I'm going to define this new length here to be L of T, where T is the total area covered so far. Then using the LCFT quantum zipper, you can prove that this process LT actually evolves as a Brownian motion that starts at the value one, because we started with a disk with unit boundary length. And then it's going to evolve as a Brownian motion uh, until it hits zero. So this only gives us one, um, one part of the description of this random geometry. The other part, um, you, you have to have a second down in motion as well. 
So this is LT. And you have a second order Gaussian motion ST. And ST is going to be independent from LT and it's just going to be some down in motion run until the same time. So LT is tracking the change in the boundary length over time. And ST is tracking how much of that change in the boundary length is due to the curve going to the, towards the left and how much is the curve going towards the right. And so this gives us um, this pair of uh, Vernon motions, LT and ST, together are sufficient to determine this uh, random surface decorated by a random curve and vice versa. Given the random surface and the random curve, you can read off the values of LT and ST. And so this is what I would, this is, this is, this is a radial making of trees theorem for um, this LCFT disk. So uh, together with Puri, we use this uh, radial making of trees to, to prove that whole thing SLE is reversible. Um, So taking a limit of this picture where you send the boundary length to zero, uh, the conclusion is that if you take an LTG sphere and you decorate it by a whole plane SLE, then that's uh, in bijection with a pair of uh, random processes, LT and ST, where LT is going to be a Brownian excursion. So we send the boundary length instead of one, it's going to be zero. So you start here and you just have a, an excursion. And ST is an independent down in motion. Now, in this picture, uh, we wanted to get whole plane SLE is reversible. We know that the LTG sphere is symmetric. When you flip the two mark points, you get the same object. And this uh, description here is also symmetric on the time reversal. Like you're drawing. Take it, what was ST? Yeah, ST is going to be, so LT would be XT plus YT. This is a total boundary length. ST is going to be XT minus YT. So if, this, if XT and YT are your usual mating of tree uh, down in motions, then LT is just a sum and ST is a difference. Okay. Yeah. You're saying the sum and the difference are independent? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can write down a proof of this pretty quickly if you want. So, so in the radio case, what is X zero and Y zero? Yeah, um, in the radial case, you can take x0 and y0 to both be equal to zero. And then I would just add a one here so that you can run until, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so adding the one, well, that just guarantees that you get to like, yeah, you're starting at length one. So I just initiate with this one here. So we want to show that this curve is reversible, but we know that this object is reversible and this whole description is reversible. And it turns out that those two together is enough to prove reversibility of whole pain SLD. Yes, I think that's the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Well, let's see. So I'm just trying to understand the geometry of what's going on with this a little bit better. Yes. So, so what are the, in this whole plane construction, what do the trees look like that are being glued? Yeah. Um, you should think of it as locally just being something like this, um, like this picture here. Uh -huh. 
but this is a local picture. So, um, okay, so before that, um, there are no trees being included in this picture. So LCFT quantum zipper is about reverse SLE, and then you have gluing, but here I'm looking at forward SLE. So you're taking, um, let's raise your right. Um, also trees, right? Whether you go forward or backwards. Yeah, you, you still get trees, but the picture is a lot less nice to draw. Um, okay. I'll just draw it over here, I guess. Um, so. It's not down here, it's like for logical reasons. So. Um, as before, you're just drawing the space filling SLE. <coughs> and then the, I guess the trees would be the part to the left and the right of the curve. It's just that you don't get such a nice picture because after some time, like when you wrap around, like these trees kind of become mixed up with each other. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I guess I don't want to think of each process X, T, and Y, T as each corresponding to a tree, but rather X, T, and Y, T keep track of the, the changes in the left and right boundary lengths, like locally. So in a small amount of time, X, T is tracking. In a small amount of time, you won't have reached this point. So you can define left and right boundary lengths. Uh -huh. And X, T, and Y, T are keeping track of those things. Okay, but I mean, on a discrete level, if I give you an, a roughly space filling path, yeah. and the complement of the path is a tree like object. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, but you're saying that thinking of it as a tree like object doesn't really help you. It's not an intuitive description of what that object is. Um, it is possible that it's one. I guess I haven't thought about this yet. And maybe we can talk more about this. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If there's no question, uh, I'll send more. <laughs>